Let me okay. introduce in alphabetical order our speakers. Marta Buchholz is professor at the Faculty of Sociology at the University of Warsaw. Her research focus is sociology of law and historical sociology. She was a visiting professor and a fellow at several renowned universities all over Europe, among them also at Kerte Hamburger Center for Advanced Studies Law at, as Culture at the University of Bonn, where she was a research professor from 2015 to 2020. To her recent publications belong a piece on Schengen and the Rosary, Catholic religion and the post-colonial syndrome in Polish national habitus, as well as an article on commemorative lawmaking, memory frames of the democratic backsliding in Poland after 2015. A very warm welcome to you, Marta Buchholz. With her on the panel is Dr. Bojena Kef. She's a writer, poet, feminist, and theorist. She obtained her doctorate at the Institute of Literary Research at the Polish Academy of Science. She's a well-known writer and poet and has published numerous acclaimed books. They come, cover a number of issues, especially anti-Semitism seen as an ongoing element in history of culture of Europe, as well as on women issues. In this regard, I would like to highlight her piece, Utwo Matze i Ojtiznia, piece on mother and fatherland from 2008, which was translated in six languages, among them German and Hebrew, yeah. and has been nominated for the Nika Literary Award, one of the most prestigious Polish Literature Awards. She's involved in the Consultative Council of the All Poland Women's Strike, namely in the anti-fascist group. A very warm welcome to you, to Bojena Kett. Thank you very much for the invitation. We're glad you're here. Last but not least, I'm very pleased to introduce Mirosława Makuchowska. She's an LGBT activist involved in the biggest Polish LGBT organization, Campaign Against Homophobia, since 2006. She graduated from the University of Wrocław, where she did her studies at the Faculty of Sociology and the Faculty of Gender Studies. Currently, she's the vice director of the NGO Campaign Against Homophobia, researching on LGBT situation and doing advocacy work. The priorities of her organization are in the field of advocating for the introduction of hate crime legislation, including homophobia and transphobia, and for recognition of same-sex unions. Furthermore, the organization is promoting acceptance of LGBTIQ through education and social campaigns. She's a founding member of the Consultative Council of the All Poland Women's Strike. Also, a very warm welcome to you, Mirka Machukowska. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Glad you're here. Now I will give um, the panelists the opportunity for some introductory remarks on tonight's subjects, focusing on three different aspects. Marta Buchholz, may I ask you to start and tell us about the course of events leading up to the recent women's strike, also against the background of the rule of law crisis um, in Poland since 2015. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and uh, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this debate. And thanks for endowing me with the task of presenting the genealogy of what's happening. And as you know, there is always a long genealogy and a short one. So I will start with the long genealogy of what I believe is, well, the the, the, the most important facet of the current situation in Poland, directly translatable to the strike of women and to the situation around the abortion, a judgment of the Constitutional Tribunal of 2020, which is of course a direct trigger of all these events. But the long genealogy does not start in 2020, it does not start in 2015. Well, when it starts, nobody knows, it would probably be in the interwar period, it would probably be with the left activism against the abortion underground, it would probably be with the leftist activism against the prohibition of abortion, which was motivated by purely social reasons, so by the horrible consequences of abortion underground and the prohibition of abortion in daily lives of 
uh, Polish society, especially the lowest, the most underprivileged classes and straight out. This is, of course, a problem which is by no means a Polish specialty and the nature of the activism of the promoters of a less restrictive legal governance of abortion was also by no way Polish specialty in this case. But there is also a more recent genealogy, and this is the genealogy reaching 19, well, reaching probably, first of all, the Polish People's Republic and the, uh, well, actually liberal uh, abortion laws that Polish society had under the Polish People's Republic since 1956. There is, it is a certain paradox, and Professor Małgorzata Fushara indicated in the, this paradox as early as in 1991, I believe, and she said, well, it's curious that the liberalization which was brought about by, by the transformation of 1989, the beginning of it, of course, the transformation is always a process, also brought about more restrictions in this very life sphere where restrictions cause severe social problems, the legal governance of abortion. 1989 in Poland uh, initiated immediately in March 1989 already, a very intense public debate on abortion. I want to make this point very clear in order that you might see that it is indeed a long genealogy reaching to the very beginning of the current Polish state the post-socialist Polish state. And I won't really bother you with all the legal details and the data for it, but it would actually be very helpful to illustrate what I'm going to say now, that abortion was in the very core of the, the attempts to negotiate and determine the constitutional culture of, new Poli of the new Polish state after 1989, including the basic values such as human dignity, human life, of course, and also including the powers of constitutional bodies. All this debate happened before the constitution of the Republic of Poland uh, of 1997 was adopted. The debate on abortion preceded the constitution, importantly enough, as did the the law on abortion that still currently enforce the act on family planning. So if you look at the recent midterm genealogy of abortion, you see that it was indeed seminal to constitutional debates. Mm -hmm. It is particularly obvious that it has been so. If you look at the second, I would argue, most important ruling of the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland regarding abortion, which was the ruling of 1997, which uh, declared abortion for a difficult situation of the pregnant woman unconstitutional. This was a very important ruling, and this really settled the abortion compromise, or what is known as the abortion compromise in Poland. It all happened before the constitution and it uh, marked the constitutionalist thinking about the right to life, about the women's rights, about reproductive rights, very importantly. So this would be the, the long genealogy and the midterm genealogy. And now let's come to the short term genealogy. Since 2015, we have, as I'm sure you all were, uh, rampant crisis of the rule of law in Poland. And this rampant crisis began with the uh, then newly elected uh, uh, parliamentary majority, a national conservative majority led by Prawo i Sprawiedliwość, Law and Justice, uh, on the, uh, to uh, take over the control over the Constitutional Tribunal. So the Constitutional Tribunal was from the very beginning in the very center of the matters. And the first step of the new majority was to turn the tribunal as uh, Wojciech Sadurski, uh, a legal scholar uh, specialized in the uh, democratic backsliding in Poland uh, described it, of turning the tribunal into a governmental enabler. This happened in, in the end of 2016. From that moment on, the Constitutional Tribunal is uh, effectively a highly politicized institution of a very dubious legal standing. And this institution 
decided upon months of having kept a motion for a constitutional review of the uh, condition for the uh, legal for a legal abortion being fetal abnormality to be reviewed and uh, finally declared unconstitutional, this institution decided, so to say, to intervene very deeply in the uh, legal order of Poland in this very sensitive matter. This is a very recent genealogy, which includes, first of all, a politicization of a judicial institution, which is the Constitutional Tribunal, and then using this institution politically to change the legal order in a manner which is not usual for the constitutional courts. Uh, it is not just my view that it was not usual, it was raised in the dissenting opinions to the judgment of uh, 22nd of October, 2020. And it was indeed an extraordinary decision because the abortion law could of course have been changed with parliamentary means. The government did have the majority for that theoretically speaking. It's an important point because it shows you that the tribunal is currently operating as a part of the politi political system and no longer as an independent institution capable of reviewing yeah. political means. So this would be the short-term genealogy, the crisis and the, of the rule of law. And the crisis is of course not limited to the constitutional tribunal. It encompasses all the judiciary and not only the judiciary, of course, also the media. These are matters which all belong to this, uh, to this um, nexus of phenomena uh, which could uh, altogether be described as the democratic backsliding and the crisis of the rule of law. And of course, the situation of the LGBTQ plus people, which uh, my co-panelists will, I am sure, also uh, be able to depict to you much better than I would be able to, also belongs to this nexus. And one more thing that I would add in the very end of this introductory remarks would be that the judgment of the Constitutional Tribunal is indeed a perfect lens through which to observe the current crisis. If you mm -hmm. read the judgment, like really read it, which few people do, arguably, because of course it's well, it's a court sentence, it's not an enjoyable reading. And it's not an enjoyable reading also because it's far less interesting than you might expect. It does not read as a very ideological document. It's rather short. It's, well, I've read more interesting judgments in my life. Mm -hmm. But this judgment shows one thing to a perfection. It shows the tendency for Poland to self-isolate internationally. In the way international is referenced in this judgment, in the way human sure. rights are referenced in this judgment, it is very clear that it is not the way of jurisprudential thinking that makes Polish constitutional order a part of a larger international legal framework. It is a way of thinking which, in fact, distances the Polish developments from whatever is happening internationally in matters of reproductive rights and uh, the right to life. So this would be the very short-term genealogy, and I think this short-term genealogy is also predictive of the things which will happen in the future also. And I guess I will stop at that and I will leave it to my co-panelists to tell you what happened exactly after this genealogy has reached the point in which we are currently together. Thank you very much, Marta, for this yeah, highly interesting outline of this whole genealogy reaching back so far. And I think this brings us also to, um, um, to the next point. Um, which is um, the development of feminism in Poland. And it is, can also be looked back um, for a longer period. And um, I would like to give the floor now to Bozina Kef. And um, yeah, could you please explain to us how feminist thoughts developed in Poland and um, also maybe how the recent women's strikes um, relate to that and what is new to, new to it? I think your mic is still um, muted. I think you have to. Yeah, of course, thank you. Uh, it was mute. Um, 
Mm, yeah. So our Ayurveda not as systematic and and Marta uh, as Marta was because I'm um, I'm not so much in the theory as in practice. So uh, so uh, I I can only tell the story from the po from the pra uh, practicing feminist point of view. So uh, I think that the first group of women interested in feminism and acting uh, and uh, acting in a feminist way. It was a group that I, um, I met in 1988, the last years of Polish, um, Polish People's Republic. And it was a, a group of the sociology students from the Warsaw University, of course. Um, um, from this group, we formed when it was legal uh, to form any any association. So we form a Polish feminist association, and as far as I know, it was the first um, uh, first official Polish uh, feminist group. Um, and of course, the trigger to all this activity, apart of being aware of situation, uh, um, it was a danger, a danger then, reality now, of a changing of uh, abortion law. And it was changed in 1993, as far as I remember. But uh, I can't say that it was changed in a democratic way uh, because, because in everything that my, uh, my colleague uh, said about, um, it was one thing that I miss, one very important institution, and this is a Catholic church in Poland. Uh, who is, um, I think, the or was, but still probably is also a very powerful institution. The reasons of the power of the power is um, there are historical reasons and mythological also, but let's take it for the grant that that was the source of the conservative revolution uh, that we uh, that we have to do uh, with in Poland. So I want to say that we, as, um, as a Polish Feminist Association, which was the organization of about 25, maybe uh, 30 uh, women, uh, but also it, it was the time when the feminist group um, groups shows, uh, show up in, in Warsaw and other, uh, and other towns um, quite often. Uh, some were feminists, some were just specific pro-liberal, pro-liberal uh, abortion law. Um, so we, uh, we collected about, I don't remember the exact number, but I think it was a million, not and a half, but something like that, million and something like half uh, votes for a referendum, uh, which were the votes, the, the signs were sent to, uh, to the same. This is the parliament of, of uh, Polish parliament. And all those uh, voices were neglected. And uh, they were never, uh, never discussed. And uh, the other, uh, there is the other thing that shows that the church was the, really the main power in, uh, in all this process. Um, it, it is that the project of the referendum uh, was never um, seriously discussed in, in a parliament because it was widely known. The majority of Polish society is um, for um, abortion law in in a shape uh, from the time of the PRL. This is Polish 
People's Republic. I mean, just the liberal law because it was very liberal. And then what we have uh, to do is it was the change of the language uh, on a wide scale, really uh, a wide scale change of the language and the language dealing with uh, mother and child, abortion and non-abortion change into absolutely uh, hmm, the language that could have a source and only and only and only in a religious way of thinking. So, uh, um, so we have in a in Polish uh, public um, discourse, uh, something like the conceived child um, uh, for the previous um, embryo or fetus um, and uh, things like that, there, there is the, is this clear what I'm yes talking about is totally clear so the language was so hugely on such a scale it was changed um that uh, we couldn't fight with that uh because if you want to fight with this um um on this scale uh activity you have uh, you have to have uh the everyday newspaper, uh, television station, or better five uh, television stations, and so on, so on, which was, uh, of course, it was absolutely impossible. But from the other side, it was this, uh, this state of, uh, of uh, average, uh, of average opinions in Poland for liberal abortion law. And I think that there is still this situation, maybe the maybe because of the very um, of the very intense activity of the Catholic Church for about fifty years, because I'm counting with the eighties till today, it will be something like fifty fifty, not seventy something to uh, to the rest, as it was in um, in nineties. Uh, okay, so as you as you can see, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, feminist the feminist attitude and consciousness and everything that we can link with the feminist at the beginning it was linked to the abortion law because it was the really burning uh, burning question burning problem. Uh, but then it, I mean, a feminist consciousness, it's, uh, it started to live with its own life. I was only a part of this life as a gender, uh, gender studies uh, teacher. Uh, so I worked uh, with students for, from nine, 1995. Uh, when it started to be oblig obligatory in Poland to have the gender studies, uh, gender studies studies uh, on the universities. So I was connected with uh, Mogorzata Fushara because she was uh, a founder, co-founder of the first um, in a, uh, in a U Warsaw University Institute of Applied Social Sciences. Um, so, uh, so this was one, one thing. The other thing was the publication and young women, um, and young women, uh, consciousness. Although I also have to say that there is very easy to, um, to say, um, uh, without looking at person, but only hearing opinion, who is younger and who is older? Because in my generation, my ge I'm older, of course. In my generation, it was even for Catholics, and I'm not Catholic, I'm not religious. Uh, even Catholics, uh, even uh, Catholic women, they never have such a heavy, uh, such a heavy uh, feeling of guilt because of abortion. 
uh, because I, I, I knew the women, Catholic women, uh, uh, you, I met uh, a lot of them uh, during the time of uh, Polish People's Republic, and it was never so anything like that. Yes, it was. It was a problem to have abortion or not if you were Catholic. Uh, but now it's um, uh, it's clear that if you have the guilt embedded in your moral system that means that you are catholic from the very from the very beginning of of uh, of your childhood uh, so you had uh, this kind of education in a preschool then and primary school and as long as it was possible uh, so for my generation it wasn't it wasn't of a, of a consideration, uh, and after all, in, in I think that in the 17s in in Poland, the practice was that if you from the 17s, 80s, and um, uh, all 18, uh, 80s, uh, it was something that uh, that is called I don't know if properly an abortion on demand. Uh, which it uh, the sound is horrible and I don't like it, but um, I think that uh, the whole meaning of this uh, expression mean that women is a subject and she uh, she have no obligation to explain her decision uh, to make abortion to nobody. Uh, so her decision was independent. So uh, this is called now the abortion on demand. And it sounds like I like to have abortion because I like to have my demands and my expectation and so on, so on. So this is all, um, so we are talking now um, still about language. There is also about the language that it used in, in Poland. So, uh, uh, strike Kobe, the women's strike demonstration on the fall last year uh, was, for me, it was um, something absolutely new because of the language, the language that became to be so so-called vulgar, vulgar um, uh, and angry and vulgar, and I uh, I said to myself, it, uh, it's, uh, it's time to be like that. It's time to be like that uh, because those young women, they, um, they, uh, they know, they, they, they feel there is nobody to discuss with. Uh, because on the other side is the representation of the Catholic Church in the bodies of, uh, of the right-wing politicians or the Catholic Church himself. Um, so this is my story and I, I, I wanted to make it mostly about language. But I think that the feminist, the word feminist, uh, uh, I think that in a, in a, a late eighties, nobody wanted to be feminist because what what does it mean to be feminist? Probably you were um, uh, you were uh, against men. What does it mean? I don't know. You hated men, um, and uh, it was a little somehow it was co connected with the socialist uh, with the socialist. Um, era of the PRL, which is not true. And, uh, and now I think it's absolutely uh, in big cities, of course, we are talking about the big cities, it's absolutely normal. And I hear in the radio that I'm, I'm listening to um, such a short jingles. Uh, when men and women says, well, I'm a feminist, uh, I'm a feminist, I'm for rights for women. And this is even, um, an, how to say, a posh thing. This is elegant. This is something everybody need to declare. Um, so this is 
um, this is a huge change, but I cannot tell how it would be, could be translated um, into social conditions, into social, uh, social activities. That, that is something I cannot tell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bojina, for this yeah, whole tour. Um, <laughs> yes. On this whole tour. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this point you mentioned with um, how important the language and the framing mm -hmm. has become is also very relevant if we look at the situation of LGBTIQ plus in Poland and the anti um, campaigns um, launched last year where yeah. The ideology, the phrase of um, it being an ideology was um, yeah, pushed to the front. And so I would like to turn to Mirka Makurowska now. And um, could you please tell us about the situation? Um, yeah, give us an overview of the situation of LGBTIQ plus in Poland today and also how the feminist movement maybe is connected to that and in how far LGBTQ plus issues are important in the recent women's strike. Sure. Um, maybe I will, I will begin with a little uh, information about, about the history of LGBT movement in Poland and uh, how we've been doing for uh, the least, uh, recent 30 years. Um, I think that the public discussion about LGBTQ uh, community has public meaning being present in mainstream media, uh, discussing openly uh, sexual orientation by some celebrities and so on. I, um, I think it could be dated back to er, uh, early 2000s. And I think it's a general uh, approach of the activists and the organization that they were growing. Uh, there were more and more activists, more organization and so on and so on. My organization actually started in 2001. Of course, before that, there were uh, other organizations. There was Lambda Warsaw and other Lambdas in other cities. But generally, it wasn't a sub before 2000. It wasn't a subject that was publicly discussed. It was a huge taboo. And I can actually remember uh, mainstream media like um, TVN that is being under attack right now from uh, by the government. They want to um, take back their license so that there will be no more um, quality information uh, independent from the government. I remember in 2000, I think it was 2005, when they were discussing uh, the pride parade that uh, was organized in, in Warsaw and, and it was banned by, um, by Lech Kaczynski, uh, who was back then, he was the president of Warsaw. Yeah. And there was a discussion whether it's okay to have uh, a demonstration of uh, gay people in the streets and so on. Actually, it ended up in the uh, European Court of uh, human rights in Strasbourg and we won. But back then I remember the language was the homosexuals were having, uh, wanted to have a demonstration and they were having a fight with the counter demonstrations. So it was, it was imaged like there were two uh, equally, yeah. um, equal parts of this uh, um, public life. And they had uh, some kind of uh, different opinions whether it's okay to demonstrate in this uh, in the public space that you're LGBT and so on and so on. So uh, the language has shifted dramatically, and now it's uh, um, well, it's it's actually not possible to use this kind of derogative language uh, on LGBT community by the uh, liberal mainstream media in Poland. Uh, so I think we've, uh, for 15, in, in 15 years, we've made a huge progress yeah. from starting from a point that there was no discussion in 2015. Uh, we ended up with having like 30, 40 LGBT organizations have been LGBT marches in almost every uh, bigger cities in, in Poland, having um, the celebrities coming out and uh, public figures saying that they support LGBT rights. Uh, 
Mm, the one thing that we did not achieve during the, this time is was a legal change. Uh, we were advocating, and we we'll still are, advocating for legal changes to have um, a civil partnership or marriage equality or uh, any other legal changes that are important for uh, improvement of the situation. Uh, and this has not happened. Uh, I'm sorry, it's my dog. <laughs> um, okay, it's gone out. Um, so for the 15 years, I think we've been, and we all had this feeling that, okay, this is going in the right direction, right? And, and we are making progress and more, more people are more supportive. And at one time, the, there's gonna be shift in the parliament and we'll, we'll have the equal rights that we are observing in our neighboring uh, uh, countries like Germany, like, uh, you know, like uh, <laughs> right now it's almost the, the, the whole uh, European Union has a civil partnership. It's only five countries left that have don't have this kind of legislation, including Poland. Um, but the situation changed in 2015, and my uh, my colleagues have already discussed it. Um, how it changed the um, ge general political climate and how it uh, impacted the democratic standards. Uh, and I think what what uh, LGBT rights have become during these five years, I think that the best metaphor would be like a scapegoat. It was an uh, an instrument in the hands of Jarosław Kaczyński, who was the leader of a um, law and justice party, um, the current government uh, um, party that, that won election, two elections in the row. Um, uh, and the uh, um, there is a there is there are a lot of similarities between Poland and Hungary, and I think what Jarosław Kaczyński was doing was looking at Orban, and he was lessing, uh, he was learning taking lessons of how to change the democratic standards so that you have more uh, power, so that you uh, change the balance between the power structures and the power divisions. And one more thing is to how to choose the right um, vulnerable uh, social groups, such as LGBT, uh, to scapegoat and to instrumentalize them into, uh, in order to, uh, to threaten this, the, the society, uh, which is quite conservative, uh, to gain more power. Um, so between, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think between 2007, uh, 18 and 20, we had three elections in a row. Um, and every single time the community was, uh, uh, was targeted. And uh, as it was mentioned before, the, the, the main narrative uh, around LGBT uh, people was that it's an ideology. Uh, in different countries, it, it has different forms. It's, if in some countries, it's called gender ideology. In some countries, it's uh, LGBT ideology. Uh, so in Poland, it's LGBT ideology. And what it's uh, packed in this uh, tool, rhetoric tool, is the danger uh, for, uh, for children because gays are actually pedophiles who want to uh, sexually abused children. This is one thing. The second thing is it's a threat, of course, for the traditional, normal Christian values and traditional Polish family. Um, and the last thing I think it comes pretty nicely in the package of uh, the general threat from from uh, from the Brussels. <laughs> the Brussels meaning. Uh, the European Union, the liberal, other liberal countries that have introduced uh, equality tools and legislations and are more acceptant. And they are 
very often they are portrayed as uh, those bad examples of uh, how look at those you know look at the belgium look at germany look what's going on there you've got homosexuals parading in the streets uh, naked and if you want that okay but we do not stand for that we want our normal families to be strong and we want to stand up for uh, our Christian values. I think it's, it, it goes pretty nicely into this myth, uh, mythology of Poland as being uh, the protector of Europe, uh, uh, Europe's Christianity. So very often when I hear uh, Polish uh, right-wing politicians, I, I hear this, uh, you know, uh, 19th century uh, language of we are going to protect the Europe from the invasion and the invasion is from LGBT. This is the current enemy. And um, th there is, of, of course, the, um, the situation has impacted the community very, very, um, very much. And th there's, there's a rise of violence and discrimination and uh, the situation is, is not, not so uh you know stable as it's been before 2015 more or less stable but um i think there's another side to that i think this is something that has shifted and has changed and there is an uh, analogy between uh the change in the language uh, uh like using those words like get the fuck out sorry for my language get the fuck out of here this is the, the this was the main slogan of of, of women and still is uh, and it shows the anger the anger of women saying okay we don't want to you know uh, we won't have it no more it's uh this is the limit and uh Uh, it's and I think for for LGBTs at some point it was the same. Um, there were new activists coming to the streets um, and using new uh, methods like uh, destroying uh, trucks were um, having uh, homophobic slogans. There are numerous trucks going around different Polish cities in Warsaw, many others saying homosexuals and pedophiles and they are going to sexualize your children. Do you want that? And it goes around the the, the city with. Uh, huge uh, speakers and saying those things and and, and at one point that uh, this uh, collective of uh, young activists uh, they started to destroy those trucks they said I won't have it no more because they are going around my in front of my uh, building in front of my home and I won't have it anymore so I uh, it's uh um people are i don't want to use the word radical because i i think the the, the measures and the the words that are used in the language and the tools are adequate it's not radical i think it's adequate when when, when you look at the situation so um we we've stepped to a new era uh and this is uh, i i think it's extremely important and on one side from the women's uh uh movement it's the change of the language and we're talking about abortion every single day and it's wonderful because before that when i uh, like before 2015 when i i was discussing abortion it, the, the abortion was discussed uh, on media it was uh like once a month there was a story oh maybe we should liberalize oh no 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 everybody is against it the church is against it women don't want it oh let's forget it right and now we discussed abortion in language that is absolutely new and for lgbt is uh is there there's a new quality there are new supporters there are new people standing hand in hand together and this is my closing remark that Polish LGBT movement and the feminist movement have, uh, since I remember, I've been in activism since 2005. Uh, my colleagues will uh, can tell you what was before that, but we've been always hand in hand, always. When I was back in my hometown in Wrocław, when I was organizing an equality parade, it was always the feminist movement, the organization that we would go to to ask for support, do it together because we. Had no resources and so on and it is still the same way right now of course there are new challenges there are some new trends that are um something that we have to deal with like the 
ah, uh, what's the name? I hate this name, but uh, uh, trans exclusionary radical feminism or something like generally it's this movement of some of the feminists, but I wouldn't call them feminists to be honest, saying that the um, trans rights are not uh, human rights. Okay, maybe that, that I will close my uh, statement, uh, the, the introductory words now, and uh, I'm very eager to hear comments and questions. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mirka. You um, also raised so many points, um, and there are definitely a lot of questions, and we should delve deeper into that. Um, Maybe we can have take a look at the um, at the actual women's strike. Um, take a closer look at it right now, as we have um, sort of now have this basis for um, further discussion. And um, yeah, I would like to ask you to um, tell us maybe more on the participants of the strike and um, in how far did they share a common. Um, did, do they share common aims or was it rather a heterogeneous group that sort of came together? And um, yeah, how would you, how would, would you say there's a big common denominator or is it um, rather this, um, well, refusal to accept the de facto total ban on abortion? Um, yeah, maybe Marta Buchholz, would you like to start? Well, Thank you. I think, uh, well, Bozena would be much better equipped to discuss that, but I, uh, okay, I might just start by playing a devil's advocate and saying that on the whole, this was an impressive way of, really the most impressive wave of social protests in recent Polish history. And it was a singular example of so many social forces coming together in one cause. And then, as a sociologist, I must say, when people come together for one cause, they usually come together for one cause only. These are these one cause social movements. And the biggest problem of one cause social movements is that, well, the cause either expires or loses its mobilizing potential or gets dissolved in the publicity around it, or people just get tired, you know. One thing that I'm sure Bozena would also mention is the fact that all these protests, all this campaigning took place under the COVID-19 restrictions. This is something where we are currently, where we are probably, this would be my pessimistic assessment, facing yet another wave of COVID, but we are slowly forgetting the previous one, I think. But this really was a sense, both a real and a sense threat to personal health and security. And it was played out also by the government forces as well as, a, as an important argument against the protesters being irresponsible, acting irresponsible, putting other people and themselves at danger while the hospitals are fighting and struggling to keep the sickness at bay. So, this really was an impressive mobilization. Whether behind this mobilization, a positive program of a political change could be found, well, it is problematic, I think. The future will show. We are still not in the po at the point where we could say anything for certain. I think this certainly did show a great, well, anger, as Mirka said, anger at whatever was happening anger at the situation in Poland since 2015. And anger is a very powerful political emotion, but it's not exactly a very constructive one. That's one, one, that's another point. And the final point, coming back to what I have said in my introductory remarks, I am absolutely certain that the same judgment, and I can very well imagine the same judgment being issued in 1999, if everybody, anybody bothered to ask for a constitutional review of this condition to the abortion's legality. I can imagine a different constitutional tribunal, a proper constitutional tribunal, so to say, an absolutely lege artist, so to say, made constitutional body, issuing an identical interpretation of the constitution. 
it's not, I, I'm not sure whether it's all clear to those who are not following Polish public life, but uh, it's also what, what Mirka said. It's not like we have now a bad government and the good society and the good society is all you know, libertarian in matters of abortion and uh, same-sex marriage, etc. No, we have a deeply divided society. It's not like everybody's good, only the government is bad. And it is quite possible that the balance, the figuration of political forces would also produce a very conservative constitutional tribunal without a democratic backsliding. But I'm sure of one thing. If, if this was the case, we would never face these large protests because a large part of this anger was fueled by the democratic backsliding by the sense that all the institutional life in Poland is tumbling down. Many of these people would never really go out of home under the COVID-19 against the legal judgment. They would probably seek other means, other legal democratic means of political mobilization. So this is, I think, a very important context. And I just wanted to make this point and I leave it to those who know more to tell us about the protest from the first line. Thank you very much, Marta. Yeah, Bojina, would you like to um, continue on that? Um, you are also involved in the um, Consultative Council of the All Poland Women Strike, as well as Mirka, who was a founding member of it too about like the participants and yeah but i i think what uh, what uh, alexandra said it was um, um um sharing the same opinion and um so it was very interesting also but i think that yes yes the polish society is very deeply divided and the uh, the worst is that it's it looks like it's half to half so uh, this kind of, of, uh, of balance is very hard to, uh, to change. Um, so it could be this kind of situation for, I don't know, I don't like it, uh, I hate it, but it could be uh, quite stable. And uh, well, and I think the same about the protesters, the, the, those were protests, um, um, of one, uh, uh, Alexandra said one cause, but I think, yeah, maybe yes, and but also with uh, different motivations, with a different motivation. Uh, for example, some of protesters, which were very young, and it was very nice, uh, uh, some protesters uh, would like to get the so-called comprom compromise uh, compromised abortion uh, abortion law with the three exceptions and it will be it uh, the other others um, uh, others um, have a different point of view but also and that is interesting for me because this is the place when I belong uh, but also there are more radical, more radical uh, participants uh, who also, uh, uh, who are also, some of them are part of the women's strike committees uh, because there are different committee, uh, committees working for different causes like education and uh, uh, mainly, uh, well, and anti-fascism and education and feminism and um, ecology and so on and so on. So what we are doing in those committees, uh, um, uh, to tell the truth, we are dreaming. Uh, yeah, we are dreaming, they dreaming, because uh, the draft of the very deep changes for uh, for example, of the Polish education system, which is really from the 19th century, especially if you have to deal with the literature program from the humanities. Um, so yeah, you can you can make the draft of the of, of a deep, very deep change of the education. 
uh, you can make the draft of the very deep change of the medical service in Poland, uh, conditions of abortion, and so on and so on. But you can just uh, you can just um, uh, print it, write it, uh, print it, and uh, have it in in a network. Um, what are the consequences? Unless you don't have political power, uh, which could um, uh, which could try to make those values and those um, ideas uh, uh, made alive in in a social life. There are no consequences of this activity. Um, um, I was for uh, I was for the idea that the women's strike should um, create uh, create out of this kind of activity some political uh, representation. Uh, and this is, I think, something that divides very deeply the um, activists of, of women's strike, because as far as I know, the leaders of women's strike are uh, very much against this, um, this idea. And after all, they are leaders of the women's strike. Um, they have about now they have, they had and they have about 60, um, uh, 60 causes in, a, in the courts uh, uh, made by Ordo Iuris, which is very uh, Catholic, um, uh, quite powerful organization. So they are blocking in, in fact, they, they, they made a huge obstacle to any further process of the women's strike because you have to run from the court to the court and then write the next letter and the next petition to the Brussels or whenever. Uh, so I, I really I don't know what will uh, what will uh, show up of of this thing, but from my experience, I may it's it's uh, it's because of of um, uh, Alexandra said Alexandra, uh, I was the member <laughs> uh, of the first um, uh, equality parade in Warsaw. It was about half thousand of, of a people and two dogs. One was mine and it was white and the other was black. And half a thousand people. Uh, it was much more uh, police forces than the protesters. And the last, so we, we are talking about 20 years, yes. And the last, last one be, before COVID, and uh, the protests in COVID, but I wasn't I wasn't there uh, because of my problem with with my leg. Uh, uh, the last one it was about eighty thousand of people, and I want to mark uh, very seriously that the Polish society is not a French society. Uh, it's not usual to have millions on the streets. After all, the Warsaw is only two millions, but it's not usual to have millions on the streets uh, because there is something new to protest. So if you have um, platforms with music, uh, about 20, that you have to, you know, you have to organize, to pay, to have sponsors. And it, it was a very powerful sponsor. It was Orange, as far as I remember. Um, uh, and 80, about 80,000 of people, it's really the huge turn. And it's probably express something. And uh, also not always the same. 
not always the same, yes, because some of the protesters may say, I want um, not have some, I said, I don't want to live with a country with transphobia, homophobia, and any other kind of phobia. Yes, and the other could say, I want legal uh, marriages of any kind of person's uh, orientation, adoptions, uh, um, support of state for this kind of families, and so on, so on, and so on, which could be as radical uh, as, let's say, the Swedish way of thinking or Scandinavian way of thinking about equality, because there is also um, the problem of how we are thinking about equality. Yes, so that's the that's the picture I I can paint. Um, confusing. The the picture is confusing. Thank you, Bojena. And if I understand it correctly, the street protests reached their peak or sort of declined um, declined since um, January, February. And um, yeah, I would like to ask you, what would you say was the reason that it happened at that point? And how is are the protests continuing now? If I understand it correctly, the Consultative Council of the Women's Strike is still operating. And as Bojena yeah. said, sort of daydreaming um, for a yeah. better, um, yeah, society state relation, but um, yeah, maybe um, Mirka, would you like to comment on that? Um, I think Bojana said, uh, said it all. <laughs> oh, thank you uh, very much. <laughs> no, I, I really agree with your how you see this and the, 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 the council was, uh, the council of the strike was, um, the, the main main purpose, main goal of the council was to um, kind of dream about the, the the Poland that we would like to see in the nearest future. Yeah. So that it would be a, like a political agenda for the future for the next uh, elections, let's say. And okay, these are um, the the things that we care about these are the uh, this is the Poland that we want to see in in next yeah. five ten years and as Bojana mentioned there are I don't remember right now but I like more than 10 of like 12 or 13 uh working groups that are yeah, something like that yeah something like that right yeah. preparing uh I would, I would say like a, a, a policy papers for the future. What, yeah. what, 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 how we want to see the education yeah. system working, how we want to see the LGBT uh, uh, rights uh, um, in the future. What about the climate crisis and so on and so on. And uh, it's, it's all very, very grassroots. So there are people working actually in the NGOs and the activists, institutions that are, you know, doing this work for many many years and i also have this feeling that it was it, it is kind of a daydreaming right because we are here discussing how we want to have a marriage equal sorry marriage equality or how we want to tackle climate change but at the same time we are dealing with the government that wants to uh wants to ban free media in two months, we might end up with a situation very similar to Hungary that the number of uh, free uh, media outlets are, is extremely limited. And uh, yeah. I, I think this context is extremely important because on one hand, we have a group of, uh, I, I think, a quite substantial group of people who want to to see the change in Poland to more progressive, more liberal, but at the same time, the fundaments of the democracy are collapsing. And I think the real question that we should be asking ourselves today is whether we are going to live in a country with uh, free elections and free um, elections that are not um done in uh, belarusian style i don't want to use these uh, comparisons that are too strong but uh something that might look more uh like uh, 
uh, the countries that are that's that have democratic standards below uh, what we would like to see in the European Union. So I think it's extremely important to remember that, for, of course, we need to have this uh, all these ideas from the Council to be uh, kind of translated into a political power. And this is the discussion whether to have strike women strike as a political party, or maybe it's, it should be like an, an advocacy group saying, okay, we have all those millions of people saying that they want this stuff and we are discussing with, with, with the parties that are gonna um, hopefully in the future uh, uh, be in the parliament more, more maybe more liberal. Uh, but I, I'm not really sure whether we're going to have a free elections next in next two years, uh, because the the scenario that we are looking at is is more, uh, uh, yeah, it looks it looks more is darker than we would like to see it, and it's it's this extreme like. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, a huge gap of uh, work of the council and the, like dreaming, daydreaming about the Poland we want to see. And at the, at the same time, we're kind of, you know, on, on, on the edge of uh, maybe losing democracy in, in the very near future. I, I know it's a big word and sometimes uh, uh, Polish um, uh, journalists say, hey, don't, please don't use that comparison, don't talk about poll exit all the time, because when it's actually going to happen, then we're out of the strong uh, language, and uh, uh, we should not, you know, put those threats in, in public. But this is extremely difficult in this situation when this... Uh, mm, when we are making all these small steps, well, not the government is doing, small steps toward the edge, right? And it's very difficult yes. to say where exactly are we? Yes. I, in my personal opinion, I wouldn't say that we are uh, a country of rule of law. The division of powers between different uh, democratic actors is in so imbalanced right now that the rule of law doesn't really stand right now. So talking about the judgments of the constitutional tribunal, well, I would, some say it's just, a, you know, a group of people who met together and, and made some kind of paper and doesn't really mean anything because they were not judges. And uh, yeah, I think that the, when dreaming about the future and uh, LGBT rights and women's rights, it, it won't happen if we do not have, uh, if we don't go back from this really bad uh, direction of, uh, you know, maybe uh, not, uh, you know, uh, going back to the times where uh, freedom of speech, freedom of uh, election wasn't so obvious. Thank you, Mirka, mm -hmm. also for this um, yeah, vision into the future a little. Um, we will surely all follow um, how the, so the women's strike organization will develop if it will found itself as a political power um, or um, stay or be an um, advocacy group. I think it's a good point now to open the floor and the discussion yeah. for questions from the audience. And yeah, um, yeah you're warmly welcome to uh, raise your hands with the Zoom hand button or also uh, give a note in the chat um, or post your question there. I will um, yeah, keep a list and try to take them in the order of appearance. Yes, who would like to go first from our panelists? Virginia. I can. Um, yeah. I don't know if I'm mute or no, not. No, you're mute. Okay, okay, okay. So um, I think that the problem of, of, uh, of a possibility of uh, what, uh, what women's strike could do or could not do, for me, in my, on, in my opinion, is... Uh, still the problem of the political representation. Um, and in fact, I'm somehow surprised that it was no big, demonst big 
huge uh, demonstration uh, in Warsaw and other cities uh, because of the last decisions that somehow threaten Polish place in in European Union and uh, I think that still majority of the Polish um, society uh, want to be in European Union. They value very high the membership membership of uh, in European Union. Uh, do not ask motivation. Um, so. This is my point of view. Yes, it could be mobilized. I think the, the, um, this uh, a social power of, of uh, anger, of women's anger, a social power around the problems of equality, because there is, as I told, it's still about equality in, uh, in the case of women, in the case of LGBT, Q plus people, uh, there is everything about equality, and uh, and also, uh, if you remember, maybe uh, in uh, 68, 1968 in, in France, in Paris, the students have the slogan, the watchword that uh, said, uh, let's be realistic, let's demand impossible things. Um, and uh, right, because utopia is a kind of frame that organized your way of thinking. Yes, the direction of thinking. Only it could, could not be, uh, which is also, I think, the Polish specialization, the, the mobilization about this question, on other question in uh, this month, in May, in April, in uh, July, because of this, because of that. And then the army is uh, dissolved and everybody are back in their lives because it's not working like that. Uh, although it was the, historically, it was the, the way uh, in which the Polish nobility uh, act, acted in the case of war, in, in any case, mobilization and then dismobilization, yes, activity and, oh, let's just stop these activities. It have no sense to do any longer. So that's why I'm thinking about the political representation for all this power, this energy and, and mobilization of a thousand of people and, uh, 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 the, the other thing that uh, the other thing which is typical for um, I would say for, for and that Mirka said about it that uh, journalist uh, who said oh let not use this uh, dramatic language let's not uh, let's not talk about the horrible threat of oh let's use this dramatical language because the situation although we don't know how it looks really but for sure, it is dramatical situation. So um, the tools that are used are not uh, compatible with the situation normally. From day to day, yes, from time to time, we have the huge demonstration and we can see the anger that we are very, um, which is very familiar to us. Um, but it's not the way of uh, having uh, of re. Um, it's not the way how we could realize any any uh, goals uh, from these protests. I'm not um, well. I'm not the optimist. <laughs> I'm not. But I'm also I'm not pessimist. I, I just want to say I don't know that traditions that are not very good traditions of, uh, of uh, activity, the Polish traditions, which are not, uh, not modern. Mm, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mirka and Marta, would you um, agree to this or would you like to add something? 
Well, if I might very briefly, I, I like Bozena's point about the um, historical patterns of um, political mobilization yeah. in Polish society. I would only add one point to that, this weakness and this like sinusoid of mobilization, which was characteristic indeed of early modern yeah. Poland, and then to Poland, to Poland up until the 18th century and Poland was no longer there. And the, well, yeah. the problem was at least for a time uh, mm. solved that way yeah. was also the weakness of the institutions yes and it's a very important thing because of course popular mobilization is possible without an institutional framework but it's very difficult to educate society to offer really yeah. valuable long-standing substantial input into the political life if no institutional framework is available yeah. That's why I find the point that was made by Martin Krieger a year ago, I think very important. What is happening now in Poland, apart from all the other things, is a destruction of the institutional framework for political life. And this is, of course, a big threat, not only to the rule of law, it's a threat to societal bond in general. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Then I think we will... Um go over to the next question, uh, Angelika Nosberger, please. Yeah, thank you very much for your very interesting insights. I would have a question to Marta Buchholz, please. You had this um, long-term perspective and I was somehow surprised, I never thought about it, that um, there was sort of a, a more liberal approach uh, during uh, the communist time towards abortion and then it was turned around and that happened as I understand you sort of uh, concomitantly with a new uh, elaboration of the constitution. So my question is uh, was that perceived as a backslide at that time or how was it perceived because it's somehow uh, I always understood that uh, it was in the beginning at least perceived positive to have the possibility of elaborating a new constitution and self-determine life and and uh, but um, concerning LGBTQ rights it's opposite because I understand that in the old uh, communist time there was no way what whatever to to even speak about I guess I, I don't don't know and the the second question is um, what you say about this half and half society that is that is, I think, uh, more or less the same in Hungary, that you have really 50%, 50%. It seems always as a big majority, but as a matter of fact, it is not. And there I wonder, uh, and once more going back to the long-term perspective, if this half and half, was that already in the, in the communist time, or is this phenomenon now really a new phenomenon? Um, yeah, these are my questions, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well. Um... Thank you very much. And I'm afraid this might turn into a rather long lecture. So I will mm -hmm. try. No, because it's a well, it's quite a bit of history to cover. Yeah. But I will be very brief. And it's actually something I'm working on now. Uh, this mystery of the liberal communism turning into a restrictive anti-communism. I would uh, highlight one important point that Bozena mentioned, the role of the Catholic Church. We are prone to start thinking about the Catholic Church in 1989, as far as abortion is concerned, but it's not entirely right. If you look at the Catholic Church's teaching on abortion, on marital ethics, because from the Catholic point of view, of course, well, procreation is something happening within marriage, essentially, or should be happening within marriage, it's a sacramental marriage, and this is a part of marital ethic, whatever happens in the course of procreation. So the Catholic Church also evolved as far as it's standing on abortion and marital ethics and what we would call reproductive rights is concerned. And the change took part between 1960, or I think eight, Humana Vita encyclical, and the 1995 uh, Evangelium Vitae encyclical. This was a period when the Catholic Church launched its own human rights agenda, which partly coincided and partly did not coincide with the secular human rights agenda, let's say it in the period. And it decided to put abortion into a larger framework 
of various other uh, problems related to uh, what would then be called somewhat imprecisely and incorrectly citing various church documents, the civilization of death. So this period between late 60s and early 90s, it's a period when the church is really defining itself as an actor in this conflict between the Western civilizing model, which in the church's perspective this, uh, disregards some fundamental values such as life and human dignity. And this would also be the period when in Poland, the Catholic Church is the single biggest, relatively, not fully, but relatively independent agent opposing the Communist Party. Of course, they're also working together. It's not a full opposition. This would not be a possible under the circumstances. But since the 1950s, the church presence in Polish public life and social life was an important factor. And then you see the abortion is again in the core because the communist power does allow abortion. Whereas the change is increasing a campaign to sensitivize Catholics all over the world, not just in Eastern Europe or Poland, to the moral problems of abortion. And it does so successfully because this sensitivity is clearly rising. And now you might ask, and this was also your question, Professor Nussberger, why was it necessary to sensitivize the Catholics? Well, because they did not really perceive it as such a huge moral problem in the very beginning. This would be, a, I think, a correct assumption, although there is not really no, no reliable research to that effect. But we do have reliable research by the Center for the Study of uh, Public Opinion in Warsaw, covering the period until 2016, showing that the support for the so-called abortion compromise of 1993 was actually rising. And the number of people supporting abortion on request or on demand, I, don't, I, I, I really prefer to say on request because request is something legal. You have a right to make a certain request. Yeah. So this, the, the support for abortion on request was decreasing. So the church sensitivity campaigning clearly brought through. And your question whether it was perceived in, 19, in 1989 as a backsliding, yes, it was by some, of course, by the activists. Mm -hmm. It wasn't by those who saw it as, a, as an important point in abandoning the communist relics, because this liberal abortion law was a part of hostile communist biopolitics. This was, uh, this is a very brief story of what happened in the long run, but it still bears on the current debate. For example, the biopolitical arguments are coming up on the, on the right side and on the left side constantly. And it's related to demography and it's related of course also to the European westernization and modernization context. So we are still in the middle of the same debate, I would argue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then we will, um... We have Thomas Kowronek. Yes, thank you. Thomas Kowronek from the uh, Ruhr University. Um, yes, actually, I thought I would be asking primarily Mirka Makuchowska since I'm interested in rhetorics. And, um, but uh, as Marta Buchholz just um, showed, um, this anti socialist or Catholicist rhetorics that is um, developing right now. Um, uh, so, my question goes to all of you. Um, could you elaborate, Mirka Makuchowska, a little bit more on this auto, on this image of the protector of Christian values that you have mentioned at the beginning, this kind of auto-victimization uh, auto of the political power? Thank you. Um, I think that this rhetoric uh, uh, is, is pretty handful for several actors uh, right now. On, on one hand, it's very handful for, for the Catholic Church, uh, which is going through a crisis right now and uh, is not as powerful as it was, like, say, two, three years ago. Uh, mostly because of the discussion and debates uh, about pedophilia in, in Polish Catholic Church. So it's still one of the strongest, in my opinion, uh, institution, uh, political institution uh, in Poland. Um, 
So on one hand, it's, it's very handy for uh, for the Catholic Church saying that, okay, we are not, and this is what they actually did with my community, saying we, we are not the pedophiles. We are not the bad guys. They are, you know, and pointing fingers at, at uh, others and saying, these are the people who want to sexualize your, your kids and so on and so on. But I think the real question is when where it came from and uh, who are other uh, uh, actors who are uh, pushing this kinds of rhetorics. And uh, Ordo Juris was al already mentioned here, and, but, but Ordo, Ordo Juris is a Polish radical uh, fundamentalist right-wing uh, religious Catholic uh, organization. It's, uh, it's growing in numbers. But actually, Ordo Juris is only one of the organizations who is pushing this kind of agenda. And maybe some of you has come across uh, the, uh, the document called Agenda for Europe. Agenda for Europe is a document that was uh, um, prepared by a network of organizations like Ordo Juris because there are many more in, in most of European and not only European because it's a global phenomena uh, movement. Um, but for Europe, it's called, uh, the document is called uh, Agenda for Europe. And it uh, actually says exactly what are the political goals of the movement. And uh, one, on one hand, it's uh, what are the goals? So the goals are pretty obvious. Uh, it's, um, uh, if, if there are uh, rights that have been achieved when it comes to women's rights, like uh, to abortion or fighting domestic violence and so on, so they should go back. So it's, it's like uh, a bit like uh, taking back the sexual revolution. In Poland, it's a, it's a bit different because it's, uh, it was not like in the Western Europe. The sexual revolution. So on one hand, it's, it's uh, taking back the women's rights, LGBT rights, uh, banning uh, divorces, banning abortion, uh, and so all, all those uh, different uh, uh, achievements of, of different social movements. And, the, uh, and, and another part of this really interesting document is, is how, is the tactics. And this is when uh, the language comes in. And one, one of the biggest and the more, I think it's, it's one of the most important fundamental uh, um, tactic is to put yourself, yourself meaning the, this uh, conservative uh, radical movement in a position of a victim. So when they are, for example, when they are talking about, uh, when they were talking about LGBT rights, they are not saying, oh, we want to get, we, we don't think you deserve rights. You are not a human being. No, they are saying we are the victims of LGBT activists because they are attacking our rights. For example, rights of the parents to decide what kind of curricula should be taught during sexual education at school. The, the rights of the parents to uh, protect their children from pedophilia and so on and so on. So I think it's it's one of the tactics to put yourself uh, that they are putting themselves as uh, in a position of victims. And another, I think it's a very, very uh, dangerous tactic and unfortunately quite successful is to um, uh, uh, to enter as many uh, powerful institutions with in different uh, uh, power structures to influence them from the inside. So you can see uh, people from Ordo Juris and other organizations in uh, institutions such as uh, the Supreme Court, the people who are candidating to the Constitutional Tribunal. But you, when you look at the broader picture, you see those people uh, in the institutions such as UN, uh, they have an uh, office in Brussels so they can uh, actually uh, influence uh, uh, the European Commission and the Parliament. And unfortunately, their uh, strategy is very uh, well implemented. And uh, the progress that has been made by the anti so-called anti-gender movement 
in Poland, but not only in Poland, is quite impressive. Uh, so I, I really uh, recommend you to uh, look more into the document and um, actually the one of the uh, leaders of uh, women's strike, uh, Kalantina Suhanov, has, has, has written a book about um, the, um, the roots of, of, of this movement and what are their goals and uh, tactics. So I don't remember the title of the book. My, my colleagues will. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Is there anything um, the panelists would like to add to this? Okay, then we will um, proceed to the next question um, in the chat. And um, it is a, um, the question is whether it could be part of a part of a solution for the self determination of individuals to let the European Union declare universal rights against discrimination, for example, to formulate that in every European Union country, people who can get pregnant must have access, safe access to abortions and all people should be able to live out their own identity and sexuality. Could that lessen the impact of white right-wing parties and um, yeah, organizations such as Order Juris? And um, um, it is added that the EU itself is an institution that should be reflected critically. So I would like to give the floor to um, our panelists, um, who would like to start out? So the question, if it would be a, yeah, if it would be a solution to um, determine European wide rights to individuals in that sense. Maybe Marta Buchholz, you would be close to that. <laughs> yes, probably. Well, there are a lot of hypotheticals here. So if it were possible, which I doubt, first of all, uh, if it were legally possible to um, provide a legal, general legal framework to that effect at the European level, for all the EU countries, well, you would have to look very closely at <laughs> at whether this is really a thing that the European Union could do. Of course, the European Union can, as the European Parliament did recently, adopt resolutions to that effect. It can express standing, political standing or institutional standing to that effect. It can also um, engage in institutional action as far as uh, the treaties make it possible to defend, of course, the basic values uh, liberties, freedoms, as far as they are infringed on or endangered by discriminatory practices that somehow, well, overlap with what the question really addresses. But that's, that's hypothetical. Whether this would help, it would probably help in the sense of providing a, a legal recourse for the discriminated minorities, but well, if you look at what is happening with the EU um, jurisprudence in Poland now, as we speak, well, it does not look like, uh, like the EU law really has a direct, strong, direct influence on what is happening in Poland politically and also indirectly socially. So I would be pessimistic. I would rather, well, it, it's nothing original, I could say, well, more mobilization, long-standing mobilization is needed. And the mobilization, for example, for same-sex marriage or for AFURALE was a long one and a difficult one. And it will probably be a long one and difficult one in Poland too. And the same goes for all other human rights related matters. So I, I would say only, this is the only answer and any top-down action inevitably causes a lot of antagonism in this kind of sensitive worldview related matters, because I want to say it once again, it is not like it will enjoy a universal popular support if such a thing would ever, were ever to happen. It wouldn't, it simply wouldn't. 
looking at the world view map of Poland. And uh, uh, coming back to, uh, to Thomas Skowronek's question, there's one little addition, something we do not mention at all. There is one other underpinning antagonism in Poland, which is also rhetorically very powerful. This is the urban rural antagonism. So the big cities versus the rest, the big cities versus villages and small towns. And there is a powerful linguistic aspect to it and a lot of tropes and motives that can be used for political mobilization too. So uh, this was just a side remark, but it adds up to that. There is a lot of polarization and top down won't work, my view. Thank you very much. Um, would you like to comment on that too, Bojena, or otherwise we could also to proceed to another question? Well, um, sorry, I have to unmute myself. Well, I agree generally with, uh, with Marta, uh, uh, but also uh, if I, if I could add something, uh, something more, not from a point of view of, uh, of uh, uh, people who know, who knows anything about law, because I, I know yeah. very little law, um, uh, very little. So uh, I would say that it would, the situation that we are talking about, uh, the imaginable one, uh, it would uh, made greater the attitude of, of a victim, the attitude of a victim, the right, uh, the right side is very prone to play a victim. Uh, and in, po in Poland, there is also because of mentality, because of history, because of mythology, because of everything. The victim is the victim and the victim is a kind of a sacrum and dot. Um, uh, so uh, if you are presenting yourself as a victim, it's also ended the, any kind of discussion. The, you have no, no moral position to discuss anything. Uh, but also we still do not, we, I mean this divided Poland and the, the part which is not the, the very traditional and the part which is not uh, nationalistic and the part that is liberal and for Europe. In fact, we don't have any longer a common language. We don't have, and even this, um, uh, that Marta, this um, antagonism uh, the city and the rural part, it's also, uh, it's not so big in the context of women's strike because the protest for women, uh, for women rights were in, in places when they, they were unexpectable in very small, in very small places not only in every big cities, but also in very small uh, villages even. Uh, so the brave women acting there. So it's, it's also shows that, that this, this conflict when we don't have any more uh, common language, and then we cannot say that this, this action of you, European Union will have this kind of effect uh, because it's uh, uh, because the effect could be absolutely the opposite one or no effect at, at all or just the victim is now crying and shouting and then the victim could lay down on the ground and said I'm killed which is the moral yes blackmail for so it's complicated and simple at the same time. Thank you, Bojena. And I think Thomas Skowronek has another comment. Mm -hmm. You are still muted. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, thank you, Bojena Kev. Um, but was there actually a time when there was such a thing as a common language? Or what about what kind of common language were you thinking of? Um, um, 
uh, well, a common, a common language. Uh, well, uh, I, I could say <laughs> somehow, yes, more common, but of course, never, we never have a common language for everybody because the common language, what does it mean? Is that mean that we are agree on this and this and this point? Yeah, so we could said yes, we agree with the previous uh, previous government, which is also which was also conservative, um, center right, um, but there were some uh, basic values as democracy. And we could, yes, in a broader public, we could say, yes, we are for democracy. Well, now there is really uh, a lot of people, I don't know how, how much, who said, no, democracy is not a value for us. Um, democracy is nothing that I can, I could concern because there are uh, greater values as, uh, let's say, um, nation, and, uh, well, I don't know what nation mean, for example, what does it say, what does it mean, nation, uh, or um, what we are talking about when we are talking about, uh, let's say, anti-abortion law, which is, as I said, rooted in religion, because it has to be, there is no other possibility uh, for the anti-abortion law. Uh, and um, at the same time, when we said, well, we are not religious country, not religious in the sense like, uh, let, let's say the Iran is religion, religious country as yes, the, the country, the, the state, which is operating on the values uh, just from religion. So, of course, we don't have the same language, but we have uh, some common values, let's say that there is 10 of them. Yes, with the previous government, I said I could say, okay, I have um, three values, uh, like democracy, equality, something. No, equality is not, not the matter, but uh, it's theoretical. Yeah, and, and I agree, I can live with these three values, but if I, with, I'm when if I'm in a situation when I uh, um, have the only constitution there is a concern, I have no common values with the government, no common ground any longer. That's dramatic situation. This is drama. This is in uh, when the conflict is uh, um, higher and the social tradition a little different from Polish one. There is the situation when the civil war is um, at stake. Yes, we can think about this kind of, and in fact, we have a state of a civil war, only it is the mental civil war. And the uh, civil war that we could see when there is a uh, mobilization like the, with the women's strike or the protest that, that maybe nobody remember of the, of the um, on the beginning it was, um, Oh my God, how it was, uh, what was the name of this protest? It was pro-democracy uh, pro and pro-European Union. Um, sorry. Jarosław, jak się nazywała ta, te protesty takie na początku? Mm. Na, na początku rządów PiSu. Komitet jest... Obrony Demokracji? O, to, 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 tak, tak, tak. Yes, of course, code. God, that's what I was uh, I was looking for the <laughs> for the code name. Yes, they were huge demonstration, really, and mobilization that could be um, um, could be almost equal with the mobilization of the women's strike, and we do not even remember. I do not remember uh, the short name of, of this of this movement, which was huge movement, because it was mobilization and disperse, and mobilization and disperse. Yes, so. 
well, that's all. Thank you, Bojena. The next question, um, Lisa. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, I wanted to ask about possible proceedings um, in front of the European Court of Human Rights and um, maybe to give that a little bit more context. Um, Marta, you already talked about the constitutional development and the sort of turn of the constitutional tribunal that had a clear political motivation. And um, Butsena and Mirka told us about um, human rights activities and um, actually like the media and um, NGOs being restricted in their political activity. And um, I was wondering, or my question would be, are there any active attempts to sort of carry those cases in front of the court? And um, if so, is, um, are they also based on the very fact that um, these human rights restrictions do in fact carry a political motivation under Article 18? And I'm, I'm specifically asking because um, a few months ago, um, the court communicated its first um, Article 18 application to the Polish government. And if those, like, of course, I mean, there's lots of steps to go after communication, but um, that would mean that the court would for the first time um, actively consider political motivation of um, Polish authorities. And what I would be interested in, um, especially from your point of view, because it's like the inside activist point of view, what um, value do those proceedings in front of the like European court and the European level have for you? Are they actively on your mind? Is it something you're actively pursuing or is it more unrealistic and impractical? and sort of like for specific and certain cases and not the general activity of um, political um, human rights activists. Um, I, I, I would say that the, uh, of course, there are numerous cases that are being uh, proceeded in, in front of the uh, European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. But I, the one that I think are, is, is more, more impactful is the um, European Court of, of Justice that uh, decides whether uh, actions of Polish authorities are in line with the European law. Uh, and the reason why I think it's more, uh, I, have, I have more uh, enthusiasm about the judgment of this court are the actual tools that are behind the courts and the legal and financial consequences that could uh, uh, could follow. And um, right now, the the, the judgment from uh, judgment from from the European Court of Justice uh, regard, with regards to uh, one of the chambers of the Supreme Court, the dis disciplinary uh, chamber. Um, says that it's uh, against European law and it has it should be it should stop uh, working right now. It's uh, there there are some interim measures put on on this uh, with this uh, decision, and um, it's a really good moment to uh, to use those tools because the because of the budget because of the. A new budget, European uh, um, Union budget that is uh, going to be implemented soon, uh, and uh, I, I think the financial tools are the only ones that might have an impact, um, that actually might uh, work. Uh, we already see that uh, the Polish government is. Uh, is hesitant and might consider changing of the changes in the law with regards to this disciplinary chamber in Supreme Court because of the financial consequences that could follow. So um, the European Union and the Commission, especially the Commission that's uh, it's an executive power of, of the European Union, has uh, ha has actually the tools to uh, to um, well mo motivate maybe <laughs> Polish authorities uh, to maybe not stop the this uh, backsliding of democratic uh, standards, but maybe slow it down a bit. 
And I think that the, and I think this is really important that uh, we're not talking about stopping the, the phenomena, but slowing it down. And every time we slow something down, it's uh, we have more, we as a democratic opposition, we have more chances to uh, to have a free elect next free election and take over the power. Uh, so I I'm, I'm really hopeful for uh, new judgments and new decisions from the European Commission uh, and you know standing behind the fundamental rights and the fundamental uh, values of the European Union. Thank you, Mirka. Is there anything you would like to add to this? Otherwise, we will um, proceed, I guess, to the final question, as also time is um, running out. And um, yeah, I would like to ask Alexandra for that and maybe for the panelists to combine it with a small final statement. Well, it would be difficult for me to say because I'm actually I have more of an observer's perspective. So from my observer's perspective, it seems that I, I've been looking a lot into, uh, into the um, anti-abortion and pro-abortion mobilization in various countries recently for a research work that I'm doing now. And it seemed to me that uh, the international networking of strike COVID was actually much weaker than it could be. And it was indeed a very unique initiative and maybe part of the problem was its uniqueness. Part of the problem was the nature of the cause and the, the, this political legal environment in it, which is operating. And your remark regarding Germany not having something like that, well, it might be partly owing to the much stronger institutional structures of German public life. You don't need something like that if you have so many possibilities of expressing yourself well, I do not want to idealize Germany as is often the case in Polish discourses and having lived in Germany for so many years, I'm fully aware that each country has its skeletons in the closet, you know. But uh, there are definitely possibilities for articulation of social differences, even though they might be very contested and of course they might be challenged on so many parts and sometimes violently too. You don't have something like that in Poland, and it's also a problem of institutional politics not giving you this possibility. Like there is so little space for feminism in the variety of its forms in Polish institutional politics. It's not like you you, you can really find the representation of so many ways of thinking about the role of women or the LGBT people or anyone you want to think of in Polish politics. It's a very limited sphere indeed. So that would be my answer, but it's only a part of the answer, of course. Yeah, so Bojena and Mirka, what would you say from a more inside perspective then? Well, if I may, um, uh, the, the, the same uh, opinion, I have, I have the same opinion as, as Marta. You don't need uh, you don't need the women's strike in, in Germany and happily, happily you don't need it. Uh, because the, it is an expression of the very weak institution, democratic institution and democratic way of thinking and tradition and uh, everything like that. But about the international network for the women's strike, um, I think because I yeah I was thinking about the the position of the the position of the women's uh, in Poland and uh, in the context of of uh, European uh, countries of Western dem uh, democracies. Uh, because this is the context for me. So the network, uh, why the network? Why the problem of the network? Why the question of network? We do not have, although we had once in Poland, some quite good solutions, social solutions during the time of so-called uh, socialism. Um, 
but we we don't. Uh, why we don't have it? Because half of the Polish society do not care. So what have we to share with the uh, with the Western countries? Um, um, Self pity, or uh, the nagging, or whatever we want. We want for the beginning some uh, regulations that are working now for years and years in uh, West uh, Western Europe. Um, so we could ask uh, our sisters, let's say in Germany or Norway or whenever, how do you solve this and this? This is for, for the people of law, this is for sociologists, for the ma makers of politics, social politics. Um, I don't know, um, but we are, I mean, the uh, Polish women in, in a position of uh, hmm, uh, the orphan, the kind of orphan in Europe, yes, I'll be my mother. I don't know why do we, uh, it's, it's nice to have a net, network, international web network when we have also something to offer. Yes, to uh, other countries, uh, but we are uh, on a, on a position of of the patients uh, at doctor's office. Well, that's all. Thank you, Bozina and Mirka. Would you like to add something to that? Um, Very short last. I think yeah. I I would just say that I I think of a women's strike more as an uprising uh, movement than. Uh, something that could be shared in uh, as a that's <laughs> European language good practice to mm. you know uh, to um, uh, to push forward some uh, social causes that we care for. Um, yes, po Polish people, Poland is is good in uprisings, right? It's a. Uh, it, mm, let's say that the, the, the movement that becomes uh, out of anger, out of uh, uh, willingness for freedom and for, so on and so on, it's, 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 uh, it's easier. The more difficult part is organizing and keeping it going in the long run. Mm -hmm. And this is something that we could actually come and learn and how to strengthen our yeah. institutions uh, in the future so that yeah. we do not have uh, we do not end up in this situation that we are right now in the future. Mm -hmm. But it, in the end, I would say that the Polish as Poland as a uh, as this still young democracy did really really well for a very very long time, and it's, uh, I just think it's something that it has to be uh, cherished and nurtured all the, all the time. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is a very good uh, final statement for it, um, today's discussion. Thank you so much um, to our panelists for um, having taken the time and um, having shared your expertise and knowledge with us. And thank you everyone for participating.